Welcome back to the Spiro Avenue Show. I am a hardworking guy. I think I'm the hardest working <laughs> guy you know because this is the third show for us in five nights, and that's, that's high volume for me because this is like the fifth thing on my list of priorities. Not that I don't love you all, but I would say my job, my wife, my kids, and, and school, which I have a big finance exam coming up, are all ahead of everything here. But for my fifth priority, I think I put a lot of time in it. I'm very proud of that. And look, I try to make my father proud. That was always my goal as a kid. And I remember growing up a lot of the time, he would tell me, uh, don't be a goofball. And I'm kind of a goofball. Anybody that knows me, I'm, kind of, I'm a silly guy. And I was really, really silly and goofy when I was growing up. And he would say, this homework assignment's important and take your life seriously. And it's not a joke. And he's a little more stoic and serious than I am, to, to say the least. And I mean, he was right. I was a total jackass kid. There's no question about it. But let's be honest, there's something to be said for that as well. We generally like the goofball, and his antics are amusing. I mean, really, if you ask yourself, like, hey, you know, everyone went to school, right? I mean, 99% of you have gone through school, middle school, high school, whatever it is. Who is more popular, the class clown or the bookworm that sort of mostly stood to himself, stuck to himself, didn't say much? But obviously, the class clown, everybody liked him. I mean, you know, it's, there's no quicker path, really, in school, at least in the school I went to, to isolation than being a high achiever who takes things extremely seriously, the kids that never go out and never do anything. So we like the cool guy who doesn't care about grades. Not saying it's something we should uh, strive for, but that's the guy we like. Let's face it. I mean, we all watch The Simpsons, right? Bart Simpson is a lot more popular in his school and amongst The Simpsons fans than Martin Prince. Probably for good reason. Nobody likes Martin Prince over Bart Simpson at the school or sitting on their couch watching that show. There's a reason Revenge of the Nerds is a popular movie, and there's no such thing as Revenge of the Jocks. They're already beloved. There's nothing to get revenge for in the case of the jock. So the goofball, whether it's me, whether it's Bart Simpson, whether it's the guy at your local school that you grew up in, the goofball's harmless to us. We like the goofball. He's no threat to us. That's why we like him. He's not going to outperform us. He's not going to succeed in any way that's going to amplify whatever insecurities we have inherent. So his sole function really is to amuse us. And we like the guy. And we should. For the most part, he's not a bad guy. Paper airplanes in the back of the teacher's head. This guy's not blowing up the school. He's harmless. He's fine. He's a good guy. Brings me to the topic of the night. The Detroit Lions hired Dan Campbell in January. And months later, I've arrived at Two conclusions. And it started with the press conference and brings us to this past week. Two conclusions with Dan Campbell. Dan Campbell is a great guy with a likable personality, a guy whom I'm rooting for to succeed. That's the big number one. And number two, he's never going to win big in Detroit. And we got off to a rocking start at that aforementioned press conference in January, talking about biting kneecaps ripping off limbs. This is his introduction to the Detroit media and fan base. And we all cheered. We were all happy. It was fun. It was different. But I think we all know, I think even Dan Campbell knows, as he's acknowledged, none of that stuff means anything. And that, you, know, you fast forward, there's, there's other steps along the way, but fast forward to now. This week, Dan Campbell shows up at a press conference with a helmet on. <laughs> just, that, that, that's how he, that's how he's kicking things off now. So, I mean, we'll, we'll play we'll play this just for the seven people that are watching this show that haven't seen this already. This is Dan Campbell, the Bart Simpson of Detroit coaches, with his helmet on uh, in honor of his appearance at this race that's coming up. So let's let's throw that Ben and let's, let's roll from there. This gives me a chance to go out and see some of our fans who I know will be out there, but then just watch a good race, man, around some good people. So I'm pretty excited about it. I'm very excited for, the, for this era. And really, we all cheered. I mean, maybe I didn't, but the vast majority of the Detroit fans cheered. It was fun. It was different. Again, it means nothing. So today, I ask you, if you like this, hell, I, I even kind of like it. It's amusing. I'm not offended by it. It, it doesn't offend my sensibilities. But I'm going to ask you. If you're going to defend this and say it's no big deal. You tell me, what is the precedent for a goofball coach succeeding at the highest level? or even in college. It's a short list. And we've seen a lot of them flame out. It's not a small sample size. We could spend a lot of time on it, but I'm going to keep moving. But you don't need 
a telescope to observe these examples because a lot of them have occurred in our backyard. You don't need binoculars. You certainly don't need a telescope. Peel the shades back. You'll see examples of what I'm talking about. But I'm going to start outside of your backyard, and then we'll get into your backyard very fast. But this is just one example. We'll get to a couple more. Rex Ryan, famously of the Jets, later had a one-year stint with the Bills. It was a failure. Rex Ryan is probably the, the apex of Tom Fulry for coaches. Like he, he got to the conference championship twice, the final four, if you will. So he was on the doorstep of a Super Bowl twice. And this is like, he is like the Bill Belichick of goofballs. So this is Rex Ryan at a press conference making a fool of himself. We could have pulled a, an entire hour of Rex Ryan clips making a fool of himself. Here's one. He's asked questions. He gets frustrated with the media. He starts, for those not watching and just listening, he starts standing off to the side and turning around. He's doing like a 180 on, on the stage. It's a joke. So this is Rex Ryan a few years back. Say that he has a I can say anything I want. That's the beauty of this country. I answer the question. I can answer it a hundred times. Here, I'll stand backwards and answer the you question. The I'm question. going sideways. At the appropriate time, we'll make that the, the announcement when I think it's the appropriate time. Yes, Brian. I understand That's Rex Ryan. By the way, the Rex Ryan that fans love, that media embrace, if nothing else, for the material. We all liked Rex Ryan for the most part. He, he was fun. He's goofball, foot fetish, the whole thing. Bearing footballs at midfield of the practice facility. I, it's fun. How do you do? That's your apex predator in this, in this stratosphere, in this jungle. That, that he's the top of the food chain. Rex Ryan getting on the doorstep of two Super Bowls. Nothing to scoff at, but if that's the best you got, and then the guy flamed out in one year at his next stop, I, that's not a good apex predator. That's not a good jungle. That's a pretty friendly jungle. All are welcome in that jungle. You'll be just fine. Let's move on. Back to our backyard. A particular sauce bar for me as a Michigan State fan. This is very difficult. This is a, an audience that loves Michigan State and is going to have their cortisol shoot through the roof when this name is invoked. This is John L. Smith, who, again, just like Rex Ryan, because this is the nature of goofballs, there's not just one clip you could have pulled. There's 100. We pulled one and threw one at the end. John L. Smith. After a big Michigan State win, Jeff Smoker, the quarterback, after the game, is up there talking to the media. And we'll just let the clip do the rest of the talking for me. This is really insane what happens. Let's go. Uh, my, grand my grandparents are up here, my two brothers, um, my parents. And, uh, you know, I'm going to hang out with them and enjoy, enjoy the time with them. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Hey, that's the first of many. <laughs> that's how he knows how to get on off the stage. Oh. That got a little hard there, but he likes it. <laughs> Our guys are into pain. They... Oh! <laughs> Very dignified. So we did throw up a different day where he's slapping himself. So believe it or not, there was more than one. John L. Smith slapping himself in a press conference incident, so you can't even chalk it up like the guy had a bad day or something. He's that goofball. And people loved it then. I remember John L. Smith showed up to the Jim Rome uh, tour stop at the Palace of Auburn Hills and was taunting the Michigan fans because Lloyd Carr wasn't there. He said, where's your coach? Where's your coach? Michigan State fans ate it up. Smart fans like myself and a lot of people in my social circle said, maybe you shouldn't be poking the bear on a, on a bear that's mauled you every year for the last 25 years. But I digress. Let's stay local. Again, and this is a little bit more uh, widely focused because you may not be a Michigan State fan, but most of us, whether it's begrudging or not, are supporters of the Detroit Lions in this audience. This is a doozy. Again, there's a reason there's a term lionized for coaches. This is one of the ultimate lionized moments. Marty Morningweg, believe me, I wish there was video of this, but as it is, this is pretty grainy. But this is Marty Morningweg addressing an incident where he had in his first training camp in 2001, he had just been hired a few months prior, goes off on the players for not hustling hard enough, abruptly ends practice, throws his whistle across the field at no one in particular, and then hops on a Harley Davidson that was like right off to the side as if the, like, the most staged thing ever, by the way. What's his Harley doing like 10 yards away from the 50-yard line? But I, I digress again. And he, he hops on his motorcycle and he jets off. I wish there was tape of that. There's not. There, was, there wasn't at the time and there's not now. 
But there was plenty of accounts in the media. This is the next day asking Marty Morning, like, hey, what happened? Why'd you storm off uh, that practice yesterday on your Harley? This is Marty Morning like in 2001. There was nobody on the football field that was ready to practice. And I'm talking players, coaches, equipment, PR. Here's what happened. Another cell phone goes off, and that's a, that's a, that's a, that, that could cause a lack of focus. It's a distraction. Right on the sideline it goes off. Secondly, we were a little lethargic coming out. Third thing is that it took about a minute and a half to set up a second PAT field goal team. And then lastly, I'm sick of people not getting to the end zone and finishing plays. And it's that simple. Over and done with, and that's yesterday's news. I don't know about you, but I'm inspired. By the way, the guy was just hired. He hasn't even had his first preseason game yet. You're already making a scene, uh, hustling off in a Harley? This thing was off the rails uh, before it got on the rails. Never on the rails. And I don't know if people love that but uh, across the board, but a lot of people did. I'm old enough to remember. I'm, I'm not old, but I'm not young. At the time, people thought it was so cool. No more nonsense. It's a, you know, kind of the new attitude thing. They love the Millen and Morningway connection with the, the Harleys. They both had these big like $87,000 Harleys that they rode around in with bandanas. People ate that up. They loved it. How'd Marty do? Five and 27 in two years. One of the worst coaches in NFL history, objectively, by any metric. So here's the bottom line. Uh, I'll tell you what does work, because goofball coaches don't. Here's what does, and I'm going to prove it to you. Boring. Boring coaches work. Coaches without viral moments. Coaches that don't make for a good T-shirt. In fact, Dan Campbell had a biting kneecaps T-shirt available from several outlets within days of his introductory press conference. Rex Ryan had fans getting uh, foot fetish T-shirts at the time. Boring coaches don't have that. They don't have a foot fetish t-shirt. They don't have a ripping off limbs t-shirt. They don't have that. Boring coaches work. Here's what boring looks like in the NFL. You tell me if boring is good or bad. Let's look at the fact, not what makes you happy and warm inside. Winning this coach in NFL history, the top five. Let's rip through it and talk about their profile. We'll start at the top. Don Shula, rest in peace. Great steakhouses there. 328 wins. Veteran of the Korean War, attended Mass every morning, was known as maybe the nicest, calmest, chillest guy in the history of the NFL. Take my word for it. Whether you do or not, I don't care. Look it up. That's his reputation. Number two, George Hallis, 318 wins. Veteran of World War II, awarded the Bronze Star, which is like the highest uh, courage level award you can get in his division, by the way. And he has the George S. Hallis Courage Award named in his honor still to this day for the NFL player that exhibits the most courage in his profession. So uh, doesn't seem like a goofball to me, pretty serious guy, World War II vet, awarded a bronze star and has the courage award named after him 100 years later. And I don't have to give you a whole lot of background on Bill Belichick. Number three, 280 wins. Just watch his press conferences, please. That says it all. This guy has many things. A goofball is not one of them. He's certainly not viral in any traditional sense. Number four, Tom Landry and his hat, 250 wins in fourth place. Oh, look at this, another theme, veteran of World War II, business suits and fedoras. And they had the famous Don Rickles quote to put this in context. Don Rickles, fantastic comedian, again, rest in peace. 80,000 people in the stands are going nuts, and Tom Landry is checking to see if his hat is on straight. He was so buttoned up, stoic, calm. He could have won the Super Bowl and not even lifted an eyebrow. That's Tom Landry. And wrapping up, number five, Andy Reid, 221 wins, a devout Mormon. That means you can't have caffeine or alcohol. That makes him pretty boring by default, right? <laughs> and, of course, if you watch him, completely devoid of sideline emotion. So I just gave you the top five coaches in terms of wins in the history of the NFL, two of whom are contemporaries, three of whom are ancient. But what's the sort of overlying trend, right? Do I have to spell it out? It's there. You know who you don't see up there? Any clowns. And you want to look at number six, seven, or eight, it's like Curly Lambeau. So it's not like I cut it off right in time to get to hide the goofball. Ain't no goofballs up there. Closest you can get, I guess, is Bill Parcells, who was a character, but not a goofball. As serious as a heart attack with Bill Parcells. I mean, he, he took his career very seriously. Eccentric, not a goofball. It's different. So I think I made the case. We know what boring looks like. And look, I've openly admitted on the show, I am a curmudgeon. I, I'm a huge curmudgeon. I, I, that's probably one of my biggest character flaws, and I'm a curmudgeon on this, but 
this case doesn't bother me. Dan Campbell having a helmet on, it doesn't going to offend me. It's not Helen Lovejoy, won't someone please think of the children for me. It's not ruining my day. But I look at what has worked historically, and that ain't it. There's no precedent for it. Hey, maybe he, maybe he is the trailblazer, and he's the first clown that wins at a high level in the NFL in the 100-year history of organized football. Maybe. I'd love it. I hope I'm wrong. I don't buy it, though. Look, I find Dan Campbell amusing. I find him interesting. I find him likable. I like the guy. Rooting for the guy. He's about as easy as a guy to root for as there can possibly be. But I got to tell you, this won't work. And I've said it from the beginning, this won't work. Because we like the silly guys. We love them. Silly guys don't win. That's where we are. We hired Bart Simpson. Not offended. Bart never offended me. I'm not going to cast my ballot for him to uh, run for president anytime soon. That's that. That's where I stand. And I'm going to hand over the mic 97% of the time the rest of the way to the guy across from me. This has been a many years courtship of Nick Baumgartner <laughs> from The Athletic. I, I, I don't want to shame him by giving the exact date <laughs> of when I first contacted you. And you, 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 your kids have had more volleyball practices than anybody <laughs> I know. I, it's, I, They're it, under two, so they can't have Well, I get it. You know, you're friends with Brendan Quinn, uh, who That's we were true. talking before the show, is, for my money, the best sports writer in the country today. Yes. He's, he's number one. And I, I always laugh because when I asked him on the show, he just said, uh, yeah, I'm going to pass on this. Like, he didn't, he didn't give me, like, the I have a volleyball practice thing that everyone, <laughs> like, everyone in the world has a volleyball practice the same night of my show yeah. for, at the same time. I don't know who's having these, like, 930, who, a 10 year olds having a 930 volleyball practice, but apparently everybody in the media is kids. <laughs> so I, I, I admire Brady Quinn just going right at me and saying, No, nah, I'm not interested. Just cutting right to it. Hey, go. he may not like me. I like him. <laughs> so, look, I'm called a Debbie Donner curmudgeon. That's my brand, I guess. I mean, it's not intentional. That's sort of just been incidental. That's mm-hmm. what's been the result. That's what people think. So I just don't think this worked with Dan Campbell. I'm a cynic. Am I missing the mark here? Am I just being an ass? Like, what am I missing if I am? I mean, I understand all of that. Like, I understand anyone who says exactly what you just said. Like, you know, the goofball doesn't win, the, the sloppy, you know, because what I think of Dan Campbell, honestly, he reminds me a lot. Uh, his personality reminds me a lot of Brady Hoke, who I covered uh, for five or six years, whatever it was, four years, I guess it was at Michigan. And Brady was, is a really nice guy. You know, the guys loved him. Um, the coaches loved him. Everybody in the building loved him. But eventually, you know, that became, you know, sloppiness and everything else sort of permeated through. And it just became impossible to ignore that it got really soft, I guess, for lack of a better phrase in there. So, that's the trick where it's if you're coming into a situation and Campbell was where the entire log room hated the previous coach and his, you know, entire regime and the front office. Um, I think the natural, you know, hope for a franchise would be to pivot to something different as you start again. But like you said, I mean, I think he's doing right now a lot of work to try to heal a lot of people who were. I'm not so sure about all this. I don't know where we're going. This thing looks like a mess. Ownership's a mess. They don't know what we're doing here. Uh, I think a lot of what we're seeing right now is him trying to ease people together, and uh, we'll see. But I think that you, you take into account that, look, I mean, he notes most times that, you know, none of this is going to matter. It's only going to come down to whether or not we win or lose, uh, and we've done nothing. You know, he talks about that a lot. You know, he and Brad Holmes both, they've done absolutely nothing. They have everything to prove. And right now, I think that a lot of people, like you said, they're excited because it's different and new. I think people are excited to give him a chance because, like, well, why the hell not? Because everything else they've tried hasn't worked, so maybe this will, maybe it won't. If it doesn't, I look at it as you just restart again, I guess, and try it over, but, you know, that's kind of the rub here. All right, you have a lot more interactions than I do because my experience is a little bit different in my circle and people, what I see out there. Yeah. I don't think it's a, oh, why the hell not? I think it is that people are completely all in. But you got a couple exceptions, sure. but sort of in the totality of the fan base, I'm not seeing the reticence that I have uh, very commonly. I mean, it's it's pretty right. The the approval rate is extremely high. And look, Dan Campbell, I don't blame him for taking the job. I it, but the, the bottom line is we saw you uh, the Brady Hoke example is a great right. One. That's what reminds me of a lot. He mm-hmm. checks all the same boxes that Brady Hoke does. Yep. You know, the this is Michigan for God's sakes and quirky and calling Ohio State Ohio mm-hmm. and all that nonsense. But at the end of the day, it's like we saw that does that's not enough. Right, it's not and, enough. Yeah, right. it, it's it, not it, enough. But and the thing, like, and you said it too, when you're coming into a situation that he is with, it, it, it's such an advantage. Now people think it's not, right? But 
It really is because they're going to be an open ear to anything different than what came in. Of and it's the same reason I'm skeptical with the, oh, you know, look at the way the Dolphins players responded to him. It's always easy to replace a tyrant. Everybody always yep, loved every time. Dick, Dick Duran was popular mm-hmm. when he, he stepped in. You know, it, we, we saw it obviously with uh, Bevel. You know, they loved them. You know, right. they were going to the office trying to get them. So I just I just don't buy it. I don't know, like, what the precedent is. I, I mean, you tell me. Am I forgetting a goofball coach that no. has, like, four Super Bowls? No, I don't think so. And I don't think that there necessarily would be one. But it's also, I think, important to note that, like, you know, he hasn't coached a game yet. They haven't gotten to a season yet. And I, and I think that it's fair to say, like, something like the, the helmet. And I understand where, you know, people see that and they react to that after the kneecap stuff and everything else. I'm like, well, is this guy just going to do this every time he talks to anybody? Which isn't true, but it's also like, you know, he's trying to endear himself to the city and and the fans and everything else. I think that's a big, big thing right now. I think the Lions in general were very, you know, had the antlers up about, hey, we're losing fans after the last regime. Like, I think that was a real thing they talked to themselves about. Like, people are not just going to blink and say, well, what next whatever do you have? You have to come back with some kind of, like, Real different plan. I think that they, you know, whether or not all this works together, you know, hiring Brett Holmes, uh, leaning hard into a scout general manager who has the college scouting background, which I think is super important, um, bringing in football people like Chris Spielman to help Rod Wood and these people that don't know anything about this world sort of navigate it, I think signaled that we have a plan here. And then, as I remember back, like, and then they hired Dan Campbell. And it was like, I was with you guys all the way up until you hired this guy that we don't know anything about. And I was right there in the same, probably the same boat you were until I saw what he did with his staff. And that's really where I sit on it today and why I'm willing to give him a chance, I guess, long term throughout this rebuild is that I look at, you know, Aaron Glenn and Anthony Lynn and Deuce Staley. And, you know, we watch these guys out there at minicamp and practice and such. And, you know, Chris Burke and I talked with um, Aaron Glenn and Anthony Lynn. And we watched film with them uh, a couple weeks ago or actually a couple weeks before the draft. And just fascinating stuff to listen to these guys. And these are you got to remember, like, Aaron Glenn, highest level corner you could possibly be, right? You know, all pro, multi-year all pro. When he looks at Jeff Okuda and tells him, you know, X, Y, and Z, Jeff Okuda's listening fully, completely. This is Aaron Glenn talking to me right now. It's not some guy that's never played the game that I don't know anything about from a can of paint. And I think when I saw the staff put together, you know, Mark Brunel is another one. Antoine Randall, if you see Randall out there running around, it's like people react to these guys. I think we see that now in football with younger players especially like they react to coaches who've been there in that situation and all the other stuff you know for us and everything else that you know the, the helmets and everything else can be just other stuff as long as whatever you're doing inside the building sort of stays in the strike zone and that'll be the ultimate test if can you keep it you know where it needs to be right and look here's here's what i'll say for dan campbell is i i can totally be convinced mm-hmm. that he can get this team i gotta i gotta practice now to Ten and seven. Not, yeah, right. Not, with the, not, yeah. Not, not, <laughs> not the not schedule. This, yeah. Right, right. Not this year. Mm-hmm. For the record, don't cut that. Not up. this year. No. And a lot of people that don't like me that might cut that up. Not this year, people. But like at some point, year three, year, yep. even maybe year two, if they a lot of things hit right. So I, I, I can be convinced of that I'm not saying the guy's going to go. Hold on, two and fifteen. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, maybe this year, but ultimately, <laughs> right, he's not. Right. Gonna, I'm not saying he's going to go five and twenty nine or whatever. You know, I'm not saying that. I think he can be solid. Mm-hmm. For the same reasons I thought Jim Caldwell was. Jim Caldwell is no one's uh, idea of a right. master tactician. Right. But if you just like get guys in the NFL to play for you and not hate you, I think that's part of it. That's like seven wins right there. Mm-hmm. Like if you have some talent and they don't rebel, they don't despise you. It's just you're already above half the league because half the half the league has a coach that's like about right. to get fired or just got fired. So like I can be convinced of that. But you said, uh, which I think is accurate, that you observed and you were you think they were cognizant. Of this, I do, I, yeah, of but, the fans, yeah. But I'll ask you, though, why should the conversation be, oh, geez, the, the fans are really turned off by this Quintricia thing. We better get a likable guy in here. Shouldn't that just right. be so secondary? Because there was a lot, a lot of people liked Mariucci until they didn't. Mm-hmm. A lot of people liked Morningwig until they didn't. Ron Marinelli, everyone forgets this. I don't know if you were around back then, but people love the the militant press conference that he had. Oh yeah, the bar is high. I remember. Yeah. No, no, that was <laughs> oh, that was that was before. That was morning. Okay, that's no yeah, Marin- right. Marinelli. That morning, yeah. Marinelli came in and said, uh, too, yes. hey, "Good morning, men." Like yeah. even though there's like 27 women, yeah. right. <laughs> you know, "Good morning, men." It was very militaristic, mm-hmm. you know, and people ate that up. So like, great, but that should be secondary. That should be like a bonus. Like, okay, fans like the character. That that's great. Yeah. But, like, why should that matter? I still think their head is in the wrong place by hiring him. 
I th- it was, it's interesting, and I think that, you know, he clearly won them over with his sort of, like, enthusiasm. Not, that's what it was. His enthusiasm for the job in Detroit, and he'd been here before and was part of the 0-16 team. And I think he played into that a little bit. I assume he did, you know, in his interview and everything else. And I think that it's sort of natural um, for regimes to go from, well, that was a disaster, so let's try to find somebody that's, like, the opposite of that. It's the old offense-defense thing that we see a lot with coaches. And I think that we'd be foolish to say that that wasn't part of their thinking, but I also don't know if I would say that was necessarily the whole thing. You know, I do think that the collaborative approach, again, all of these things are really nice ideas, all the things that they've sort of put together so far. And I liked how they drafted. I think that, you know, the draft made a lot of sense to me. A lot of things that they've done so far are good ideas, nice ideas, logical ideas, but they haven't been tested and they haven't been strained. And like, that's the ultimate thing. But you know, really for me, the way I look at it, you know, all the stuff that we see in press conferences and everything else, especially NFL, is just whatever. The guys don't care. The players in the locker room, they don't <laughs> they don't care. It's not something that permeates in. It's about what they see when he's out there. And he did say today, you know, we're, I'm not going to wear a helmet to my press conference during, you know, during an in-season game, whatever. But I do think that, you know, how he responds, and that'll be something to, to watch. How's he going to carry himself on the sideline during a game? Um, How is he going to react publicly? If they get embarrassed, how is he going to react publicly if they get screwed? Like all these things, right? And I think that those are things yet to be determined on, you know, Dan Campbell, the coach. Because right now it's been, what, a couple, they did mini camp, they did OTAs, and they've done one, one mini camp, OTAs, and rookie camp. So it's like, we haven't really seen much. And yeah, I think yeah it's a very it's, small yeah. sampling of what it's going to look like. I mean, it, you know, you're, you're saying people want to see how he's going to react in this situation or the other. Right. You're, you're right. You are right. I don't, though, but I'm usually the outlier with this right. kind of stuff. I, I'm so tired with this organization in particular. Like uh, other organizations, like, you know, Tigers have been on the doorstep of two titles in my lifetime yeah, sure. and, and close, you know, in that yeah. sort of uh, real close a couple other times. It, we've seen the Pistons win. I, I've seen the Red Wings win four. So, like, I'm cool with them. I'm cool with giving them a long runway. The Lions, I'm tired of celebrating everything except yeah. actual success. <laughs> Something good, yeah, right. I can buy the Red Wings. They got, I think, the best GM in hockey. They've, they, they owe me nothing for all they've done. They've That's been, a good they've point. They've That's treated me very it. well. But it's like, at some point, I don't know how, I honestly don't know how everyone doesn't agree with me. Usually I can understand. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm hard to take sometimes, Nick. But on this one, I don't understand it. Like, it just why, why do we care how we react? I'm going to look at the box score and the final score. Mm. If they win a lot of games, yeah. happy. If they lose a lot of games, unhappy. And I don't care what he says, does, or thinks up there or what helmet he does or does not put on. Right. So they're, again, they're selling nothing. They're selling yeah, it's an illusion. And all that, yeah. Right. I mean, that's, that's what you do, I think, a lot of times at the beginning of regimes. We see that a lot, too. Um, we see it in college an awful lot, too. The hope sells. And it does in college. You can sell hope and you can recruit on it. But what what I always say in college, and it holds true here too, at some point, the hope runs out and you got to like, we got to see it. So at some point, and you know, in the NFL, it's that some point is going to be right away. And it's like, it's going to be awkward to a degree though, because they're going to be bad. And we all know they're going to be bad. Like the talent level that they have right now, you know, their best players are young. Their best, you know, their most talented players anyway, I guess we could say are young and learning. And we would expect they're not going to be very good this year. We would expect maybe next year also not great. But what I would also say is when we're watching them go through the year, you watch where certain guys were when they started. And if you're seeing guys sort of incrementally go forward, then it's hard to argue with the methods and progress. But I think the ultimate, that's why it's hard for a lot of people right now. It's like when you squint forward, it's like, what's this going to look like in three years? Is he going to be here in three years, Dan Campbell? And is he going to have enough, you know, and whatever to push enough buttons? Because you, at some point, you can't just lean on Anthony Lynn forever. And Glenn, you got to make decisions too. And so, yeah, I mean, all those things will be telltale out. It was the same thing with a guy like Patricia, who had had that reputation as a stellar game plan person who could find every little, you know, thing in an opposing scouting report, whatever else, to to, to get an edge. And then he comes into a head job, and every and he's just completely in over his head immediately and just lost. So you never know until they get in there. And I think that, you know, having done this for a long time with football, there's no one way to skin a cat. But I would say, to your point earlier, I mean, you can't be sloppy, as, you know, that sort of thing, you know, the fun and everything else, you, you have to compartmentalize it. And yeah. if they can do that, I think, you know, you have a chance. But otherwise, yeah, I mean, I would agree. 
I, I think you, you're in the majority, too, with you know the fans and the reporters. I had Dave Burkett from the Detroit Free Press in, and everyone keeps saying, like, okay, you know, Dan Campbell may be light on experience and mm-hmm. you know, may not be a brilliant uh, football mind, more of a CEO, right. but don't worry. They got Anthony Lynn and Eric Glenn. Yeah, right. <laughs> Anthony Lynn has been an offensive coordinator one, one season, time yeah, that's right. for one year with Buffalo. They were middle of the pack. Not saying they were they, they ran the ball well, but they were a middle of the pack offense. Point, yeah. No, no one was saying, "Oh my God, get get this guy." He's a sure. offense. Nobody. They were middle of the pack. They were a C plus B minus offense. One year, one average year. Okay. The other one, Aaron Glenn, might be great. He Never might be it, the yeah. best defensive coordinator. Ever. Totally inexperienced. So I don't get this whole like logic of okay, guys, like. I get your Dan Campbell skepticism, but don't worry. We got these two. What a, <laughs> that you're selling me the same uh, empty box. Like I, I, mean, I think, yeah, I think that that stand. It would be like, well, the alternative would be you got two guys, or at least one anyway, and someone like uh, Lynn. You got two guys with no experience and one that nobody wanted. Everybody, people wanted Aaron Glenn. Like that was something I think at the time. You know, if you were reading the tea leaves and paying attention in, in circles at the time when you know all the coaching changes are happening in January in the cycle. Like, he had options, and Deuce Staley had options, and Anthony Lynn had options. And when we were going through all the candidates that he could possibly put together, I was impressed that he was able to get all three of those guys. Because all three of those guys, as far as I know, had options to go other places, work with other people. You know, Glenn could have stayed in New Orleans and possibly, you know, climb ladder. Who knows, right? So there were some guys that were pretty well respected that respect Dan Campbell. And it's like, I don't know Dan Campbell from, you know, from anything at that time. So it's when those guys sort of offer their insight to it, it made me kind of open my eyes a little bit and say, okay, well, let's give them a chance and see what happens. And I think that's where I'm at with it is, you know, see what happens in games, see if they can get through logically during games. And that was the thing with the draft. If they go through the draft and it's logical. Okay. If not, well, this is a disaster, right? But it wasn't, it made sense. And now you go to the next stop and see where it happens. This to me is like um, a clean as you go rebuild. It can take two years. You got to clean up your mess as you go. And at the end of the two years, you better be ready to roll because nobody's going to put up with this bullshit about, well, you know, like, I mean, we said that we weren't going to make you guys wait forever, but we need another year or two. Like that stuff doesn't work in the NFL. It might work in baseball to a degree. It might work in the NHL to a degree, but we know that NFL, right? You only have a short window. So we'll know soon enough. I think that's how we look at it. Well, the rapid timeline might not work for Dan Campbell, but it's worked just fine for the Lions. Yeah. They're, they're, they're on a 60-year timeline and counting. So, yeah, I mean, it's not, yeah. it's, it's not uh, that urgent, apparently, because they've gotten away with it and somehow... Like, like the whole, like, I'm going to give him a chance thing, mm-hmm. I, I, I guess. Sure. I, I, what, what choice do I have? I'm not yeah, going right. yeah. to, like, lay in traffic and block Jared Goff's car. From, from playing, like, to get, yeah. I, right. You know, it's like, I, yeah, I'm a Lions fan. I'm not going to, like, not watch. Mm-hmm. So, you know, doing a sports show here. Right. So I, I'm giving him a chance by default, but I'm giving him a chance in the same way I'm giving the sun a chance to rise tomorrow. Right. Like, it's, yeah, right. it's like there's right. no real choice there for me. I'm not anyway. going to immediately quit on it. Right? Yeah, like, yeah, I think exactly. that was kind of the thing for a lot of people. And it's like with a guy like that, you know, there's nothing really to go off of. It's it, He had that interim run in Miami. Uh, it was weird. You know, you go back and look at some of the videos. It seemed like it worked at the very beginning, right? Guys rallied, and then it fell apart. And it's like, you see, well, can he fix the drop-off? Because there's going to be, you know, the up, and then it's going to, you know, level off, and you're going to have to manage that drop and that'll be the ultimate you know sign of whether or not this is working i agree i mean perfect fit in detroit by the way i mean dan campbell has no tangible positive thing to sell he's a perfect fit for Detroit (laughs) Lions because they wouldn't have they ever right i mean barry sanders i guess no Mm -hmm. team success let's transition to this get off dan campbell before i you know stab myself (laughs) with my pen get to another topic this is where i'm actually a little bit more optimistic and friendly than the average lions fan which i am never on the like nice side of anything Jared Goff, yeah, I got to say, I think he has gotten a bad rap, not just, you know, regionally, I think people are giving him a chance, mm-hmm. but uh, nationally, right. I think yes. he's gotten yeah. kind of a bad rap. I'm curious, we'll start here and then we'll get into a little more detail, okay. but there's this debate going on and, and I, everyone I talk to, it's like 50-50, so I'm curious where you land. Ridge quarterback, just getting him to the next guy or yeah. the guy, and not just what will actually happen, but... You're in Brad Holmes' head. Jump into Brad Holmes' head. Jump into Dan Campbell's mm-hmm. head. What do they think? How do they see him in your mind? Like, Holmes is the, is the one that I – that's the best question. That's the one, the, like, million-dollar one, really, in my mind, is what is your – you know, you being Brad Holmes, what is your honest-to-God opinion of Jared Goff? Because you can look at this a couple different ways, right? I, I am of the belief that 
trading Stafford was the best move that they've, you know, the best thing they've done this year. I will say that. Uh, had to happen, had to do it. They were able to get, you know, a lot back, everything else, and we saw the return on that. But when you saw that, it was like, okay, well, did you take Goff because, you know, you had to take his contract to get those picks back? Was that part of the deal? Or, and if that's the case, then I'd be like, okay, fine. Then take him, take the contract. He's 26 years old, 25, 26, whatever it is. You know, give him a give him an offensive coordinator like Anthony Lynn, who works really well with younger guys, confidence problems, all these things. Maybe it'll, like you said, bridge maybe two years it works. Maybe it does. If not, whatever. We'll get out of this deal and we'll move on to the next guy. Or is it, I really think Jared Goff got a bad rap with, with, uh, with the Rams. I think that the system didn't work. I think he lost confidence, and I think we can fix him, and I think that there's a lot of good football in there, and I think he's our guy. I don't know what it is, and I don't know if he quite knows that either. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know... Uh, and Holmes is the guy here that I think the opinion probably matters the most uh, at the end of the day, because, you know, they talk about collaboration and everything else. Like Dan Campbell, I think has probably, if you look at this objectively, I would think Dan Campbell would have the shorter rope long, right. In this job. And so for Holmes, you know, when you're, when you're making decisions that impact five, six, seven years down the road, possibly it's that it's, do you view Goff as a guy that you had to take to get back all the compensation that you got for the Stafford deal? Or do you see him as a guy that, hey, we can you know put a new coat of paint on him, tweak a few things here, and he's not going to be as good as Stafford, but he'll be good enough, and we can build a team around him. That gets a little tricky because building a team around a quarterback and sometimes, right, it, well, it doesn't work. It rarely works. And, and that's the ultimate question. I really don't know. And I, I don't know. It's hard because I think Holmes sometimes, when we listen to him talk, is very careful with his words and what he says and what he doesn't say especially about the quarterbacks, especially about golf. I think he's played that really close to the vest. And I, I don't know. I think that he probably believes in golf more than we probably are. We probably do just by, you know, from the outside looking in. Um, but I'm not sure how much, like, I'm not sure if, if he would like ignore obvious, this isn't working to hang on to him for longer. Right. Like, that's the question I think I have in my mind. Like, are we going to get, 15 months down the road and have our answer and still wonder why is this not, you know what I mean? So yeah, that's, I think my thing. I don't see, I don't think, I mean, wherever you land on this, I don't think that he would go down with the ship if that's where right. his head yeah. is. I think he would move off him. My take, not based on any fact, just based on reading the tea leaves is they really do. It seems like it. Like him. Mm-hmm. And when I had Burkett in, we, we played the clip of the press conference that the Detroit Lions had shared with their social media yeah. accounts. And, you know, there was a part where Jared Goff's meeting the assistant coaches in the hallway. I'm sure you saw it at the yep. time. And they're, like, high-fiving him and giving him a hug. <laughs> and Jared Goff goes up and is like, hey, man, how you doing, sir, or whatever. And the coach is like, you kidding me? We got you, baby. Like, we're yeah. thrilled right now. They're, I mean, it was like the, the Pope walking through my yeah. little church that I grew up in. Like, right. it was just a hero's welcome. This was not, oh, look. Here's our Trent Dilfer to just uh, hold down the fourth. No, like it wasn't that, that. No, it was mm-hmm. not Ryan Fitzpatrick coming through on one of the 17 teams he's played for. Oh, okay, what's up, Fitzy? Like this was the guy, right? And that was just my read on it. I don't know how else to read it. If the you know these coaches are sitting in a room, they're talking. I there's no way if they were like, okay, you know what? He's not great. He's going to hold it down for us for a little bit. We're going to look to the future. That wouldn't be the response of multiple coaches when he walked down the hall. But wouldn't it, though? Because you're going to have to get him to work for you on some level. He, if he comes here and, and, and immediately walks into a situation and feels like, you know, not because he's very careful, too, about what he says and doesn't say about the relationship with McVay and everything and with the Rams. But, like, if he showed up and it was like, who gives a shit if this guy's here? Like, this guy's broken down confidence-wise. I think that a lot of it with the Lions has been, like, we want to make sure he's coming into a situation it's been very, like, college It's been very, and I, I can see where people would get, like, man, like, oh, like, my, it hurts your stomach or whatever to see some of this stuff because it's a little too syrupy. But, like, that's what's happening. Like, they've got yeah. damaged goods in a lot of areas, and it's like they've got to repair them. They, <laughs> they've taken these guys, like, when, when you listen to Aaron Glenn talk about a guy like Quentin Dunbar, who was a, you know, former receiver who couldn't hack it there but has a couple things that if it clicks, man, like, it could work. And they have a lot of guys like that. Because you look at the roster and you're like, what did the last regime do? They destroyed the roster. So you have to, you had to figure out ways to sort of shed salary, field the most competitive team you could, and get building blocks for the future in six months or whatever before the season started with a horrible starting place. And so I looked at it that way and said, like, this first year is going to be rough. It's going to be really hard to judge it until we sort of see what they're doing with the roster when games start. It's- so funny, like they're 
they're fake puppet up Jared Goff. It reminds yeah, I mean, that's what <laughs> sometimes that's what it feels like. You know? It reminds me of uh, have you seen Moneyball? Like when they sign Scott Hatterberg and they're yes. moving him from catcher to first because right. he can't throw anymore and he doesn't know what the f- he's doing mm. and he's at first base in spring training and every ground ball it could be it could be hit three miles an hour. <laughs> hey, Scotty H, picket machine, <laughs> like you know, yeah, just yeah, right. like, the guy's a professional <laughs> baseball player just talking to him like he's playing t ball. Mm-hmm. Like, I, look, I mean, it, you may be right. I, you're not wrong about that. That's what they're trying to foster. Yes, but I, I didn't sense that that was like a, oh, guys, he's coming. Hey! Yeah. Like, like, you know, they might have been genuine. Yeah, I, right I don't know. I mean, I'm not inside their head or heart. But my right. read on it was like they're actually thrilled to have him. Yeah. And I'm not so sure that they're wrong to be thrilled to have him. I think he's like pretty good. I he's solid. I mean, yeah. there's things that he does well. There's things that he does bad. I think that's the thing that I've noticed having watched a lot. Uh, and you go back and you watch, you know, 2017 Jared Goff and you watch 2020 Jared Goff and it's a completely different situation, but it's also a different team. You know, when he comes into that situation with the Rams, the offensive line is very good. The run game is solid and they work that play action to death. And he was the best play action quarterback in the NFL. He was never pressured. And if he was, it was a sack or whatever. But as time went on and they lost stuff up front, you know, Todd Gurley goes through injuries, everything else, and you start relying on his arm more, then it changes. And he's not. You know, golf to me is not in the in people have their opinions of Matthew Stafford. I think Matthew Stafford is of maybe he's not in the elite elite of quarterbacks, but he's in a tier above Jared Goff, I would yes. say, as a football yep. player. And I think everybody would agree with that. But the question would be is how much lower of a tier does golf sort of fall into? And is he at the top of the next tier, maybe? Right. And I don't know, because athletically, you know, Stafford had the ability to evade pressure the way golf won't be able to. Um, but then again, Detroit's built an offensive line in front of him that maybe will be good for the first time in <laughs> ever, ever, right? Ever. So possible. Um, but like you said, I mean, there, there are things that he does that we can't unsee with the Rams. I mean, there are games where he's making those throws, you know, down the seam and across the takes put the ball anywhere he wants. I mean, you know, McVay's calling plays and, you know, scheming things open, but 2017, 2018, Jared Goff was pretty damn good. And it was hard to find anything that you were like going to get overly worried or whatever about. And then as time went on and McVay wanted to evolve the offense and push the thing deep, well, now you found a ceiling and it's not going to work. It's not meshing anymore. So confidence falls apart. And, and, you know, you're left with the question of, like, what is he? What is Jared Goff? And I don't know if we know that yet still completely. But to your point, there's enough in there good, I think, to give it a chance to see if, well, maybe, maybe he regains confidence and can find himself back into a rhythm, rhythm again. But I also, at the end of the day, I don't think the top out like his ceiling's not as high as Stafford's. I mean, it's not going to be the same. No. So no. how so how much further can you go on, right? And how what can he give you to a point of, you know, have you hit your ceiling and do you have to move on? And I guess that'll be the question that's unanswered here. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason why Stafford went there and back with him came, right. you know, the other way came Jared Goff and a bunch two of, first yeah, round right. picks and a third round pick. Like yeah. no one even talks about the third round pick. Right. That's like that real That's a big deal. Too. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's a pretty that's a substantial yeah. asset as well. So it's like, yeah, obviously I think he's objectively better. I mean, mm-hmm. Otherwise, you know, why would you do that? For the right. record, I think that trade would have been a good trade. Not that it was compatible with the Rams situation, but in a world where it was, yeah. that would have been a good trade with no golf at all. Given yeah, that Stafford I, wanted yeah, out, I, like two I first agree. round picks and a third. When they made it, that's all I looked. I looked at the picks. Yeah, and then I was like, oh, they got golf. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Golf yeah, is almost like incidental <laughs> yeah, to the right. deal. But I, I actually, yeah. I like him. I'm rooting for him. Last thing on golf. You know, you're covering the team. You're a pro. Mm-hmm. What's sort of your take on these first few weeks? He, he's wearing the shorts. He's, he's slinging it. Yeah. Obviously, we, you know, Dan Campbell's doing the Scotty H. Pick and machine money ball thing. Oh, right. there's yeah. so much zip <laughs> on his passes, whatever. You've already sort of, I think, probably mm-hmm. rightfully so downplayed yeah. that. So I, I'll throw that out. But just what you've seen. I don't care what Dan Campbell's seen. You're objective. Yeah. Uh, he's, you know, I think right now a lot of the timing stuff is still coming. You know, today there was, you know, um, you know a seven-on-seven seven drill where they kind of, stu- you know, they missed – communication on some routes uh you know him and Cephas I think got crossed up a couple times him and Hawkinson got crossed up a couple times and then you could see they would stop pull aside they'd talk it over and and then it would be fine you know they'd go back through it and work it out and that happened uh during OTAs as well you'd see maybe drills against air where golf would make a throw into an area where the guy wasn't comfortable they'd talk about oh do you like that ball here on that route or here on that route right over right so I think that right now a lot of that is still happening like we've seen that sort of progressing and, you know, they're still rolling a lot of different receivers and players in there with him. And I think he's getting used to everybody still. But, you know, right now, I think a lot of it still is work on his feet, get his footwork going, because that's been another thing I've noticed. Like every drill they've done, way more footwork stuff 
with the quarterbacks this year than we've noticed uh, in previous years. I think that's partially with, you know, golf's mobility, get him out of the pocket a little bit. Work on things that, that he knows he's bad at. Work on things that he knows he struggled with. I think that's what they're trying to do right now. Maybe get the confidence up before camp. But the thing you're going to have to see in camp is like him take over the offense, him take the team over, and him just be this commanding presence. That Stafford, you know, it's like, it's funny because Stafford wasn't necessarily this guy who was this commanding, but he was. He wasn't, he wasn't. Like he could be at times. And I think that when things get a little more competitive with pads and everything else, maybe we'll see more of that with golf. Right now it's a little hard, but I think timing and everything else is still what they're going on. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's not even anything to glean much from. That's pretty much everybody in a new system. Mm -hmm. Timing's off, reps are off. I don't like put too much into that either way. And, you know, you've addressed what they're trying to fix in his game, but we had seen on tape when he should have theoretically been in rhythm. I get that. Like sort of that, that little piece at the end about taking command. I know it's early. I know mm-hmm. they're not in competitive situations yet. But if you had to guess, do you think this is his team? Like like just the personality, what's the vibe with him? Mm-hmm. Are they feeling each other out or did he come in and say, you know, I'm I, it's not command. there yet. I don't think it's there yet. Not I there think yet. I think it, you know, they want it to be. Uh, I think that's, you know, but I don't think it's there yet. Um I think the guys like him. Uh you know, they've talked a lot, you know, he had guys come out with him in LA and work uh, Cephas and some of the other receivers, Williams and uh, Perriman. Uh, I think he took guys out to dinner, whatever he got here, guys over the house, all this stuff. Uh, he's trying really, really hard. Um, and no one has said a bad word and no one has said anything, you know, disingenuous. But it doesn't seem, yeah, it doesn't seem all the way there yet to me. Like, it's, it still seems like, you know, that's kind of a work in progress, like everything else. And I don't know what to think about that quite yet, but it definitely wasn't something where he kind of came in and it was like immediately like, oh, there's golf. It was like, well, oh, there he is over there, right? So. I think that's still a process, and maybe maybe he just is one of these reserved guys. I don't know. We'll see. He's a quiet person. I think that's the vibe a lot of people have gotten, but people like him. Uh, they think he's a nice guy, and they respect him. So, we'll now, Nick, I mean, we've done 35 episodes in this format, and this is the first time that someone's been the wet blanket on a topic <laughs> and not me. Like, I was actually, I'm like, yeah, I'm kind of excited. Hey, is he coming in? I got Super Bowl yeah, on my I mean, resume. Like, you think you're a curmudgeon? That's no. <laughs> no I, apparently, I don't know. Maybe you should host the Spiro Avenue show. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I yeah. get, you got to get off my corners with the negativity here. I, I'm getting a little territorial. I'm gonna have to say something mean to catch up to you. There you go. No, I'm, I'm messing with you, but I mean, it's, I, I like him, but it's in the same Dan Campbell category. Although yeah, Jared it's... Goff has proven a lot more than Dan Campbell. Yeah, mm-hmm. but like just where they're, I'm rooting for him despite their detractors. Yeah, I think that's fair. And then I think that you know, and that's the thing that I would also say is the bigger, the other big note there would be that everybody. Was Respects them. It's obvious. Like, you know, no one seems like they've, you know, not, you know, he stops a receiver, whatever, but he stops, they talk, they chat it up, they fix stuff. You know, it's all been, it's all been positive to this point, and you can't see anything, on, anything else right now. So let's finish with this on the Lions. Uh, this is uh, where I get back into more on brand territory. <laughs> Jeff Akuda, yeah. whom I thought was a ridiculous take at the time for them. I thought that made no sense. I thought it made no sense to let a regime that was clearly uh, mm. on their last breath make a decision that was rooted, I think, Just in self pre- <laughs> self <laughs> self preservation. I don't want to relitigate that more than the eighteen right. seconds I just gave to it. But for the record, never liked the pick. I, but I didn't think he'd be this bad. I, I thought he'd be actually mm-hmm. probably pretty good. Just not. I the did right too. Pick. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, so I mean, this is like gone worse than even I thought. So I want to look at the very objective. Some people poo poo the PFF grades. I don't because I love Chris Collinsworth. I think he's the best in the business. So let's bring it up. Jeff Akuda's rookie season, a particular disaster. Look at that second worst. Pro football. <laughs> I, well, I, I know. I know. And, you know we got uh, half the audience listens right. to the audio. So we'll, they're, they're like, what are you talking about? We'll get there. <laughs> Jeff Akuda's rookie season, pro football focus, which is generally accepted as yes. the most respected objective measure of performance that there is out there. Nothing's perfect, but yeah. Agree. No. On the 100-point scale, Jeff Okuda's coverage grade was 30.9. And just think 100-point scale is just like in school, basically. Like the best cornerbacks in the league in any given year will be like low 90s, 91, 92, 70s, like pretty solid. Yes, A 30.9 is a disaster. Mm -hmm. And that was good for, by the way, dead last out of 121 qualifying cornerbacks in the NFL. and. The sad thing is, the second worst was 36.7. So again, that's uh, 30.9 for Jeff Mm -hmm. Okuda, 36.7 for the second worst. So it wasn't even close. Jeff Okuda was by far the worst. 
And who was the second worst? <laughs> His teammate on the other <laughs> side of the field, Desmond Trufant. Thank God this organization spent massive free agency and draft capital at the cornerback position and fielded by far the two worst cover corners in the NFL. And for a little comparison for a, a name that you guys might recognize, Tease Tabor yeah, there it is. was the famed second round pick of Bob Quinn, whom everyone thought was going to be a boss except Bob Quinn. Just, except like, Bob Quinn. just like Johnny Tavai. Everyone's <laughs> like, how do you take this guy? This guy is, is, is like the slowest corner ever in the combine, second round pick. That was beautiful. Matisse Tabor's coverage grade in 2018, the year that he was so bad mm -hmm. that the Lions basically found him unplayable and cut a second round pick two years in, right. was 29.9. Again, Jeff Bakuda was 30.9. So you have the two dunces in the class here. You have one guy that got a 30% on the exam, and the other guy got a 29. So like, that just gives you some context. Jeff Bakuda just put up a score almost identical a performance almost identical to the score that was so bad for Tease Tibor, whom we all agree sucked, and is out of football, by the way. That they the Lions cut him two years right. into a second round pick with no injury or no character issues whatsoever. So that's the context of how bad Jeff Okuda was. I'm curious how much you write off this rookie year for these reasons. Yep. Matt Patricia's incompetence being number mm -hmm. one. The core muscle injury that Jeff Okuda was playing through to some extent, large, small, whatever. Yeah. He later had surgically repaired after the season. And third, the abbreviated training right. camp. It was a weird season. So there's three sort of excuses there. I'm curious right. how much weight well, you do rank you rank them? Yeah. Like, it just, not that you rank them in order, but, but no, like, I, how much do you put into that? I put a lot into the third one. Um, the abbreviated year in the, in the training camp last year was like, it didn't exist. I mean, they got the guys had to show back up. I think it was in August, which was late. It was different. Um, and I think I would put a lot of stock into that. Uh, I don't know about the core injury. You know, that's something where it's like, I don't know, right? You know, I th he had a he had a groin thing early on, and then it was a core at the end of the season. He had the surgery, so maybe that's by the end of the year. Yeah, I mean, he looked dinged up, but he also looked like he had no confidence and looked like he was just generally shaken. And it was maybe you need to sit him down and just shut him down for the rest of the year. But I put stock in that, and I would also put stock in the situation just being a mess. Um, like you said, Patricia, I mean, you put the thing up there, the second worst was Trufant, because you got two guys that you're putting in situations that can't execute, and you continue to put them in those situations. That's not to say that Jeff Okuda would have had a fantastic year if Matt Patricia wasn't his defensive coordinator. I don't think it would have been as bad. It wouldn't have been good, and it still would have been bad, and we'd still be talking about this, to be clear. But I don't think it would have been 121 or 121. Um, but no, I do think though that this is a huge year for him because it was really bad. Like it wasn't, you know, and that's something you mentioned earlier. The PFF grades aren't law. They're not everything. They're not perfect. But if you watched every game and you watched every rep, you saw what the grades saw, which was a guy that was often just either getting caught completely guessing or a step off or a step behind, or he was just late on like everything. And that to me was uh, alarming a little bit to to be honest because you know I had heard for years about his you know added, ad dedication all the stuff at Ohio State and all the things that came out of that program and you saw it on the field and it was like he was awesome I mean nobody did anything against him in the Big Ten for you know two and a half years whatever it was he was a starter there and you you're like okay well I mean he's gonna be a pro if nothing else I mean he's gonna have technique down he's gonna have all this and then it was like well maybe not so I think that you know the shortened year and the situation they put him in isn't helping, but it's not to say that you know he doesn't have to come out here now and do something because it's got we got to see something here. And I think you know I watched him quite a bit today when we were out of practice, and you know he looks more confident. I'd, last year he never looked confident to me. He looked like a guy that was whistling through the graveyard, as people like to say, the the fake kind of fake it till you make it. He feels it feels a little more comfortable right now, but it's also like. You see him make a really nice play, and then you see him get beat again on something that we've seen him get beat again, you know, several times. And you're like, when's that maybe going to click for him? I don't know. But I don't think Aaron Glenn's going to take it easy on him, and I think they're going to push him really hard. And I think that it's any do-over stuff is over now, certainly. Like, you know, whatever happened last year, put it there, leave it there. Tracy Walker's in the same boat. Put it there, leave it there. You can talk about how it was miserable and you hated it, but now I got to see something from me on the other side that makes me think that it was maybe more than just maybe you're not what we thought you were. And I think that, that for Akuda and a guy like Walker, that this is a big year in that, in that sense. I'm curious if you agree with me on this. I think this is particularly problematic 
if Jeff Okuda had the season he just had in 2020, yeah. but was a second round pick or even like pick 19, yeah, like a late first rounder, yeah. like you know, mid to late first round, I it would be alarming. It would, be, yeah, it wouldn't be good. <laughs> yeah, it'd be, right. it'd be ups- I'm not saying it's like, oh, no big deal. Yeah. But like, this is particularly bad because mm-hmm. for the context of those that don't know, taking a cornerback third overall is so rare that you have to go back yes. almost a quarter century right. to Sean Springs in 1997, also a Buckeye, by the way, yeah. to find another example of this. So the argument, it's the same thing when uh, the Colts took us at Quentin Nelson, mm-hmm. at guard, it was six overall, whatever it was. Yeah. But, you know, that guy better be the best fucking guard. And he is. And, and he yeah, is. Right. So, okay. Like, right. Perfect. You know, if you're telling me I'm getting, like, the best center or the best guard, like, in the lead by far, yeah. basically anything but punter or kicker. I'm like, yeah, Do or, it. Like, yeah. yeah I'll, I don't care. Like, if, if, I, if I might have such an advantage at some position. Right. So having the best guard by far is a lot of value. Jeff Okuda, he had to not be good. Mm-hmm. He had to be Great. And you can talk about, oh, he was banged up, had an injury. The whole league had yeah, an injury. Right. Oh, he didn't have a training camp. Neither did any other Neither anybody else, right? Like anybody else, and no rookies had their first training camp mm-hmm. that year. Like to be that bad, if you're a third overall pick at that position yeah. for the first time in a quarter century, I mean, for the record, Bill Clinton still had three years left in office. Okay. <laughs> like that's how far back <laughs> we're going here. I don't think the Lewinsky thing even happened yet. So that's how far back you have to go to find this. I, he had to be great, and yeah. he has to be great going forward. So this whole, like, I, I, so many Lions fans say, like, oh, you're going to bury the kid after one year? No, uh, not, yeah. not yet. But to act like, oh, it was his rookie year, there were mitigating circumstances, that works if he's a second-round <laughs> pick. This guy needed it's a— hard, yeah. I, mean, I don't care how dumb your coach is. This guy was getting toasted on things that has nothing to do with the coaching. The coaching put him in bad spots, but, like— Come on, the guy's guys crossing his feet, back battling. Right, I mean, it was bizarre. Right, like you said, I mean, I, I don't, I don't think it would have been as bad, but it still would have been like this is nowhere near what we thought or hoped or expected or whatever for whatever reason. And I, you know, it just didn't seem like for a thousand different reasons he was ready to play. I mean, and that to me was surprising because everything you heard from, and it, I had no reason to disbelieve anything we'd heard from Ohio State people that. Jeff Okuda is the real deal in terms of his preparation, in terms of his attitude, everything else. Like, it's as good as you could possibly want it to be. And I don't think he had an attitude problem or anything else, but it just, there was something there that was like, he doesn't feel like he, he you watched him play and you didn't believe that he thought he belonged there oftentimes. That's, that was the impression I got uh, a lot of times when you go back and you look at it play to play. It was just like, he's overwhelmed before the snap. Like, he's... And when we talked to Aaron Glenn, I mean, he could see the same thing. It was, you know, it's just a mile a minute in there. There's a play against, I want to say it was Jacksonville. I can't remember who's going against, but he bit so hard on a double move that was just like, what are you doing? Like, this is a high school thing that you probably did in your sleep, you know, five, six years ago. And now you're just so crossed up and it was such a mess. And that's when I was, it was mid-season where I was kind of like, this is not going up at all. It's going at least even or down and then the injury and everything else. So. Uh, I think you leave it there and you see if you can, you can regain it. But, I mean, this has to be a much, much better year for him in every single way because how do you run away from it? Any other, you know, he's still the number three pick, right? So it's like that didn't change. We need to see more from it now. Oh, yeah, it's way too early to bail. Yeah. But I will say the fact that we took a corner third overall for the first time in that long and we're already, like, <laughs> a year later being like, oh, we'll see, you know, it could yeah. work out. I mean, there's some things going on. The guy, you know. Right. It like, <laughs> it, it, like, the fact that we're already in the reclamation project right. bin is is troubling. Mm-hmm. I, you know, and you talked about the confidence. I'm curious where you end on this because, you know, we talked about Keith Tabor. Yeah. Keith Tabor famously said, for those that don't remember, that he was the best player in the draft. Now, that's right. a common thing. <laughs> there's 15 guys over here that say that. But he was extremely yeah. boisterous and said the Lions got to steal the draft. He would talk such a big game. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe you observed something differently no. when he actually got here. He wasn't even the best corner on his team. <laughs> well, yeah, he, he, it's, it's just ridiculous. But, you know, Bob Quinn loved the tape. Right. He's the smartest guy in the room syndrome. But I saw what I saw yeah. in his short two-year tenure in Detroit was that confidence fell off a cliff. I mean, the, the guy... Uh, by some accounts, was like head down and just, yes, you know, he yes. was talking in the media. Some of the quotes that were anybody could have read were just, you know, I got to figure this out. I got to work Harder's harder. is a hard life. Oh, it's just he. Uh, yeah. I mean, it is. He, and his I, confidence was shot, though. Yeah. I mean, and that's that was Okuda I, after that Green Bay game, the second game of the year, 
when he got worked by Devontae Adams like six straight times. Yep. It just every time out from there on, I think he had one pick against Arizona, and then you could see, you know, he'd make a tackle and you could see him get, you know, and then something bad would happen and then five more things would happen. And it would avalanche. And it was the same thing like you're talking about. It was just you could see very, very early. The confidence was just not even close. Wasn't there. He did not jibe with Patricia at all. I don't know if he jibed with Corey Unlin. I think Corey Unlin's a better defensive backs coach than people probably give him credit for. I don't know if Okuda jibe with him either, but you know, was what it was and you deposit it and move forward. But you know, that's, yeah, it's definitely something that's not, you know, no one should be giving him a mulligan. I don't think at this point, I mean, that would be false and foolish to do because you need to see a lot more pretty quickly from him. Yeah. And I mean, the quiet confidence that he had, I mean, you can say whatever you want, but that clip of him, I think it was in Indianapolis where the reporter ridiculously asked him like, Hey, you know, you're known for getting really yeah, handsy or whatever. Yeah. Handsy. And he's like, have you looked at watch my, my tape? Yeah, have you watched right. my tape? Have you like looked at any facts here? Because he had like what he was flagged one time in two yeah, years, which right. is just, I mean, I've seen Michigan State cornerbacks get flagged twice <laughs> on the same drive, yeah, like right. that's exactly, just, yeah, yeah, back to back plays, yeah, back to back plays, like, yeah. like you know, it's uh, we saw that a couple of times, like mm-hmm. at the Notre Dame game in 2013. So it's like it's, it's insane, and he had, but his response it wasn't just hey, he was very oh yeah, steel yeah. confidence, and that was part of why I bought in him being good. I didn't think he was I agree, the right pick. yeah. But very confident. He seemed confident. Yeah. 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 And it's just, I'm shocked by him. So, all right, we're off the Lions finally. I, so, <laughs> I'll uh, take a breath. Oh, well, I'll, tell you, I'll take a deep breath. I'll take a 15 minute break. And no, uh, I'm kidding. But here, I'd like to talk about something that is also not going well, but doesn't affect me emotionally, at least not in any negative way. Jim Harbaugh, mm. Michigan, you're, you're yep. a, a long time cover of this program. Right. This, is, this was your original bread and butter mm-hmm. for a long time. And um, I thought you were really uh, one of the few that kind of really got into the weeds when things yeah. weren't going well there, particularly, you know, with the Hoke era. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious for your perspective on Jim Harbaugh. Let's start here. Is this the last dance for Jim Harbaugh? The fan base seems mostly fed up. Like, what's, yeah. what's your sense of where the athletic department stands? The fans seem fed up. Where do you think the athletic department stands? It could be. Um, it very well could be. I think that this is one that I do think COVID certainly played a role. Um, and I wonder about this all the time. You know, if... Last year had happened, and let's say COVID wasn't, right, let's just say it wasn't a thing, right? And last year was a normal year, and they played 12 games, and they sucked. Let's say they were just like three and nine. They probably, probably would have gotten fired, right? Like, I think he would have been fired. Probably. Right? And so, right, I think we would all agree. If he was five and seven, and they missed a bowl, I think that might have even been alarming enough for it to maybe been something they entertained. This was, you know, when the season started and they started to have their problems, it was no, 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 not doing this. We're not firing him. It's not going to happen. And it stayed that way the whole way. It was never a situation where that I had heard from anyone that mattered that Ward Manuel intended on firing him or even had that plan. But it was just like, as time went on, you were just like, well, that's fine. But there's a lot of things here that are broken and just really bad that you need to fix if he's going to be here. And my sense really has been that... A lot of people around the program, supporters, former players, guys that play with Jim, guys that played for Carr, guys that played wherever, that are invested in Michigan and want Michigan to do well, are hopeful that he can figure this out, but are no longer sort of married to the idea that it has to be him or no one else, right? So I think that I would say that it very well could be, you know, if it doesn't click around, but... Um, you know, I think you look at the contract, it was the, uh, the, the money got shrunk, the buyout went away. Both parties are able now to do what they please really without any trouble. And I would also say this, I think that, you know, on to Harbaugh's end, I would wonder, you know, if this goes another year where it just doesn't work and it's clear that you no longer, ha- you know, we talked about this with Mark D'Antonio at the end of his run. If you don't have the, you know, whatever of the locker room anymore, if you can't connect with them. You have to be honest with yourself and you have to, you know, move on. And I wouldn't put that out of the question. I don't think, I don't think you can put anything out of the question with Harbaugh, but it could be. And, you know, you look at what they are on paper and they have a lot to prove. I mean, there's not a lot there that you could look at and say like, well, they're going to win nine or 10 games. I don't think anybody could just automatically, you know, say that after what we saw last year. So, you know, it was complicated last year, I think due to COVID, but right now it's not complicated. People ask me all the time, like what, how many wins does he have to have to save his job? And I'm just like, I don't, I don't, that's not, you're going to know if they're going in the direction they need to be going in, or if this is the same. That's a good way to put it. If it's the same, then it's time to move on. And that's that's sort of how I look at it, I think, right now. And 
Because if it's the same, it's going to be bad. It's going to be rough, and you're going to know it, and you're going to notice. So, But I would also counter that with all indications I've gotten is that he's trying everything he can to fix it. I mean, you know, younger staff, guys that played here, all these things. So, you know, but we've heard this before. He's made changes before, and some of them work, some of them don't. But I look, I don't we'll know. See. What, I don't know what the perfect world is. Like, I'm not as attuned to Michigan's and the sure. movement patterns and that with their staffing. I, but I know what I read, mm. and it's it's like it's the sort of bizarro Mark D'Antonio. D'Antonio, if he made any change, would be like, okay, you were in the receivers' room. Just go down the hall, pick yeah, up, right. pick up <laughs> your binder. Like, you, no one left the building; they right. just moved down He's the hall. Moved to the offices, yeah. Like, it seems like there's a new coordinator, new assistants, mm-hmm. new quarterbacks coach, new the quality control guy every single year. Right. So it's like D'Antonio is too loyal. Hardball, right. I don't know if he's like turning guys out too much. I don't know. I just I sense that this is it. If he has another down oh, year, yeah. like, and you said it, it might be his choice. Like, let's start working. I, yeah, out. I mean, it could be. I, I don't think you could rule anything out in that situation. I think you just got to look at all things that were presented. I mean, when when I had heard and other people heard this too, but it was you know earlier in the, earlier in the year before the year had ended that they were going to offer him a significant pay cut on a number. And the thing that it was presented to me <laughs> very early on by someone that said. If we give him less money, do you think he'll take it? And I was like, if you give him a contract, you better be ready for him to sign it. Do you want him to be your coach or not? Right. And that was something that I thought as the year went on, there were people at Michigan that sort of had to answer that question for themselves and COVID complicated it. But I don't think Ward Manuel ever had to answer that question. I think his thing is, I want it to work with Jim. I want him to be the guy that is the guy that we all thought he was going to be. but. At some point, a spade has to be a spade. So, you know, I think that they're all in that space now. And I think that even Harbaugh is probably there, too. I, you know, he said that publicly somewhere in January. Like, you know, no decision I make this year will be made out of fear of losing my job. Fixing Michigan is more important. And I think that as long as you're admitting that it needs to be fixed, then that's a step further than was taken in any previous year here in the last three or four when things needed to be repaired. Yeah, I agree with everything yeah. you just said. And I think if you look at the context of Jim Harbaugh, you know, if- Four years has been the max everywhere. He's already two years past right. the max. You'll get San Diego. You'll get Stanford. You'll get San Francisco. It's never lasted more than right. four years. He's, it's a presidential election cycle. He's off or or less. Time. Yeah. So we're already two years past that, and it's like you know he's got a reputation. He kind of mm-hmm. grinds on you. I think he's a little yes, better. He does. He's a little better <laughs> off in college because you know there was a thing. I I, I wish I could give the person credit because I can't remember who said it, Mm -hmm. but someone said about Nick Saban with Alabama, he didn't work as well in the NFL, though it's overstated what a disaster he was, but because he he wears on you, and by the time you're ready to kill him at Alabama, you graduate, or you go to the pros early. So, like, there's a, he's not not apples to apples, but I think he's kind of like, even if this was going better, he might have pissed off enough people at this point. And now you, you don't even have the part where it's going well. Like, for the most part, last year aside, San Francisco was going great. And they were still like, get the fuck out of mm-hmm. here, Jim. So, I, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's right. like, it's just, you know, they hated him. It's like, okay. They did. Was, they did. And he, he really probably should have won the Super Bowl that he lost. I mean, they were right there. But I'm curious, you know, we talked about it with Anthony Broom, with Mason Brew. We've talked about it with Chris Castellani. Now of Barstool Sports. That seems cool to say. Welcome uh, to Barstool <laughs> Sports. I had a Barstool Sports guy in here. That's kind of cool. There you go. I'm going to retro the, the credit. But, um, <laughs> no, but you know, they're, they don't have a great answer because they, mm-hmm. they don't know either. I mean, they're trying. I'm curious where you stand. I said publicly, it's still out there. I didn't delete it. I, I, sometimes I think about it. <laughs> I thought Jim Harbaugh would win multiple national championships. I had an S at the end of championship. I made it intentionally, deliberately plural. And I even followed it up by saying, yes, plural. Yeah. When they hired him, this is a Sparty. Look around you. This is Michigan State. When they hired him, yeah. This is Michigan Stateville. Right. I thought, and Michigan State was rock and rolling when they hired him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I openly feared him. I had the utmost respect for him at college, at Stanford prior, mm-hmm. San Francisco su- subsequent to that. You pair, at the time, what I thought was an A-plus coach. Yeah. A plus brand, you can poo poo Michigan all you want. A plus brand, sure. incredible resources as they paid them, they paid everybody around them. I don't get, and no one's been able to give me the silver bullet answer why. I'm mm-hmm. going to put it to you. Okay. Why hasn't it worked? Because it seems yeah. like it should have. Well, I think that every situation here with him has to be looked at with who's around, who's, who's around him, right? So he comes in here, and you got to remember the roster he inherited was a roster that had, that had a shitload of talent on it that had been beat to hell like those guys 
had been told they sucked, they were terrible, they were blah, blah, blah. I mean, there was like 15 NFL players on yeah, that not team. By, not, at by least. Brady, not by Brady Hope, Right, though. so, no, uh, but by fans yeah, and everything right, else. Right. I mean, it was just like, I mean, Brady, a fell apart and everything else, but I mean, fan, they were beaten up mentally, you know? I mean, it was just mentally, and sick of it, really. I mean, you had a lot of guys on that team that were older, a lot of guys that were fifth-year guys. They got Jake Rudock and sort of hit the lotto there with the perfect sort of match, and that team bought into everything he was selling. And... All of them came back the next year, except for Rudock, more or less. They bought into it to, again. They get an inch away from the playoff. And then you leave there and you're thinking, at least me, because I, you know, I'm around this every single day. And I remember thinking, leaving that Ohio State game in 16, being like, 30 of these guys aren't going to be here next year. It's going to be all freshmen and sophomores for the first time since like 2008. He was going to be around nothing but kids. No adults, no 23-year-olds, no... You know, that offensive line the last year was all 22, 23 year old grown men. This was going to be completely different. And you felt it. The team went super young all of a sudden, and it got haywire and it got sloppy, and you started seeing disconnect. And it was like, is he able to get along with kids or connect with them, I should say, when they arrive here? Or is it just happening with sort of guys that are older? To me, I think that the youth was something he had to adjust to that he probably wasn't prepared for, didn't think about, because the first two years were so smooth. And I think it hit him like a ton of bricks. And I think that they've made adjustments from there. And they've always been just like a step or two late. I feel like, like, you know, when they hire Josh Gaddis, for example, and, you know, you could say whatever, maybe you hire somebody else, maybe you don't like Josh Gaddis, whatever. But like when they hired a spread coach in 2019, I remember thinking like, you're two or three years late. You're two or three years late and you're going to feel it. And there's been so many instances of this where I think they've made good decisions, like moving on from Tim Drevno two or three years after you should have moved on from Tim Drevno, losing Jed Fish and two or three years before you should have lost Jed Fish. There's been a lot of little things that have added up to be big things. And that's why I think you've seen this as gradual. It hasn't been up until last year, right? It had been this gradual, like, well, they're just not pushing through that, you know, top ceiling. And it was just all these little things thousand paper cuts that just piled up and piled up and piled up. And then you looked up one day last year and you're like, the bottom rusted out. There's nothing left. The guys aren't willing to hold the rope for him, or at least the current version of this staff and the team fell apart. And it was just like, there's no other way to look at this. Right. And I think that that's the ultimate sort of judgment on how this has gone. And he's had to, I think this year really look inward a lot in terms of how am I interacting with people? Am I hearing them? Am I listening to them? And who are these coaches that I'm surrounding myself with? I think it was telling to me that he hired Mike Hart. I don't think five years ago he would have hired Mike Hart based on everything, you know, that the comments Mike Hart made 15 years ago when he was a player. We can sit here and say, well, it's whatever. It's 15 years ago. It's, but when you talk about a guy like Jim Harbaugh, who's this competitive <laughs> lunatic, like he's never going to forget what Mike Hart said about him, right? So I think that crossing those bridges even to me shows some growth. But is it enough growth? And I think that that's ultimately the we're going to know. And I think we're finally at that. We don't need any more time. It's just it's going to be what we see this season. If it's good, maybe we'll get another one. If not, then you move on. I mean, backpedaling to like the Akuda thing on the last topic, mm-hmm. like the fact that we're here going into year seven of Jim Harbaugh. And now I know he scaled back, but all this money you paid him, all yeah. the hype. And by the way, justified hype, in my opinion, at the time. At the time. Like, biggest I, story in football. I was, yeah. leading, I was leading the charge, and I, I hate Michigan. Like, <laughs> it was the biggest, like, yeah. It, it was, was a huge deal. Mm-hmm. And the fact that we're in year seven, and you're correctly stating, Jim Harbaugh's looking in the mirror and saying, you know, I, I might have to look at some Dr. Phil books. How do I, how, <laughs> I, how, am, it, I yeah. how, how am I talking to guys? Like, just the fact that that conversation mm-hmm. is taking place right. is a problem in itself. Not saying he shouldn't be introspective, yes. but it just shows you Where how – far we've fallen from mm-hmm. where they were but it seems it's easy to think and even i have to remind myself it's easy to think that one inch away in the shoe from going to the playoff some people yeah. you know, coin flip either way one inch more they definitely would have won that game right it's easy to think that was so far away so way back in the rear mirror mm-hmm. but in terms of the perception locally and by the way nationally we're not that far away from when we thought this thing was still humming no yeah you look at Week one last year, the COVID shortened season. Mm-hmm. They bomb Minnesota. Yeah. 
Looked 49 amazing. to 24, and it really, like, if you watch that game. Milton looked like a high spin kid. Uh, it, 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 felt, it felt like it was yeah. 79 to 24. <laughs> like, I, I saw that, like, Michigan only won by 25. Like, yeah. it felt like they won by 50. Right. Like, just, I mean, they won by 25, and it was not that close. No. Like, yeah. And Minnesota was respected, you know, Fleck, you're yeah, in Minnesota. Players, but they were, yeah, right. It's in a full season. It's a 7-8 win program. Mm-hmm. Like, it's, you know, you're not playing like, you know, 2009 Indiana. Mm-hmm. Like, they bombed a, what's perceived to be a pretty good a team, solid team yeah. in their, in their stadium. And everyone was crowing all over the place and saying, Joe Milton's, you know, Cam Newton. And I was impressed by what I saw. I think everyone was, yeah. but not just locally, not just Michigan slappies. I mean, Joel Klatt sat on Colin Coward's couch and, <laughs> and declared after week one that this is Jim Harbaugh's best Michigan team ever. This is a team that again was an inch away, arguably screwed, whatever. from going to the playoff and beating a really, really good Ohio state team in the shoe. Like, one week into the season, we're we're told by a, I guess, by most respected yeah, yeah. analysts that this could be Jim Harbaugh's best team ever. You go to the next week, Michigan State shocks the world as a 24-and-a-half-ish point underdog, depending on what book you were laying your money in. Like, it, I feel like, look, selfishly as a Spartan fan, would I like the coroner's report to read cause of death, <laughs> Mel Tucker? Yes. Let's get the uh, objectivity the uh, lack yeah. thereof <laughs> on the table right now. But I am also the guy that said Jim Harbaugh would win mul- multiple national titles while I was uh, still a Spartan alum at that time last I checked. <laughs> so I'm willing to look at this objectively. Like, just This may be a lame question to you or to the public, but I feel like, and maybe it's my bias creeping in, that loss, I know what I saw in my – Group of friends that went yeah, there. Yeah, last year, yeah. My best friend, uh, you know, Jack, uh, played hockey at Michigan, diehard fan, grew up Michigan fan. The Michigan State loss broke him on Jim Harbaugh. Is that your perception? I think that the Michigan State loss, sort of like I said earlier, was the one that for a lot of people that were of the mind, and when I say people, I mean people that were that have a skin in the game, so to speak, with Michigan, money-wise. Um, that was the time where they were like, all right, like, Maybe not this is over, over. Maybe some were. Some definitely were. I know that. Some were like, we're done with this, right? Like, this is not going to work. Um, but it, for most, and I would say the majority, it was like, well, there's going to have to be life after this. Like, we can't just keep going forward with whatever Jim wants he gets, and we're just going to have to, you know, build around any of his obstacles or whatever. Like, none of that's done now. Like, we, we're not losing games like this. Mel Tucker just lost to Rutgers last week. He barely even knows the names of his roster for crying out loud. It's week two of a COVID year. This can't happen. And I think that even in a year like that, where you look at Michigan side and you say it was unpredictable for you too. It was a challenging year, but Hey, you know what? You didn't have to grind them into dust during June and July of a COVID situation where, you know, where maybe they wear out in the middle of the year and are like, what are we even here for? Which is what happened more or less. So like, those are all things that add up. And I think the Michigan state game was one that for a lot of people were like, look, this Anyone who was still lying to themselves that he was infallible, I think that was the day where it was like, all right, well, we're not doing that anymore. We're not going to lie to ourselves anymore. And and that was, to me, that's how I look at that day. I don't know if it's necessarily a program breaker, but for anybody who was still willingly head in sand, the sand ran out. I think that was the last day on that one, and that was that. that's how I kind of look at that one. I think, like, you know, Michigan kind of famously put the dagger in Bobby Williams' is already right. flat-out corpse. This was different, though, because Bobby Williams was already kind of like, it was, a, yes. it was already going very poorly. This is like, you have to remember that day, Saturday morning, Yes, the nation of college football fans woke up that Saturday morning thinking that this is arguably Jim Harbaugh's best Michigan team ever. Whether you agree with Joel Clyde or not, when he said that, Nobody made fun of him at the no, time. Yeah, certain people thought they were going to smoke him that day for sure. I, mean, it, yeah. I, I, I was saying you know, I wouldn't lay, you know, the, the, I wouldn't take 28 points or, or fewer in that game. And, and no one thought I was dumb. Like, right. oh, you have to take four touchdowns. Right. So it's easy to rewrite this stuff after. Yep. People woke up Saturday morning <laughs> to that game thinking this was Harbaugh's best team, and they didn't even sit down to the dinner table that day. And it was everything. Like, it was yeah. like, I, I've never mm-hmm. seen anything like that. I mean, Michigan State killed this program. Maybe they'll be resuscitated. Maybe Melisandre is going to come up and breathe some life in the John Snow. I'm not saying that can't happen. We've seen we've seen Joe Paterno <laughs> go three and nine in year 72, and right. then they were like they won 10 year games. 72, yeah, like, right. you know, but I, I'm not saying it can't. You're happen. not wrong. Like, Crazy things can happen. It yeah. can happen. Yeah. I'm not yeah. saying I'm not like completely like right. show the the body's in the ground, but I haven't put dirt on it. 
<laughs> but you know, so I'm not ruling it out. So save it, okay? With right. the with the people screenshotting stuff, I you know, everyone everyone's playing gotcha. <laughs> I'm not ruling it out. But the sense is to me, they're dead. I, I think they're dead. Doesn't mean I don't think they'll be as bad as yeah, last year. Yeah. But this team is not going to be in Columbus with this coach, right? With a play away, an inch away from going to the playoff. Yeah. The way I put it to people who asked me that exact question what is happening here in like November and December of last year? Like, do you think this is a, what are they doing? It was just like, I think that in that situation, um, they were in a spot. I don't know if you can restart if you'd be restarting in a year. I mean, recruiting's back now. They can go out there, but you got to remember like January, February, March, April. Like, I mean, if you started over with a new coach and in a COVID year, it was going to be tough, but like, I, yeah, I think that all, you're not wrong. I couldn't argue with anyone who said he should be fired. I think that's how I landed on it in November and December. I wrote that probably somewhere in December where it was like, I've run out of the ability. And I, I always try my best to, I'm going to find any piece of evidence I have to hang on, like for some guy to give him a chance or whatever, if it's still left. If there's no more evidence, I can't defend you, right? That's just logic of life. And like for Harbaugh, it was like, hey. I can't argue with you. If you think that he should be fired at all, based on all evidence we have here, I think that that's justified. If, you know, like if they made the call to fire him, like you said earlier about no one was arguing that they weren't going to blow out Michigan State that Saturday morning, no one would have argued that that was justified at the end of the year. And I think that's how I've kind of looked at it. And as time goes forward here, it's going to be, he's getting another shot, I think, based on the fact that he's Jim Harbaugh and this is Michigan and that COVID happened last year and they didn't want to restart in, in a pandemic. I mean, losing that game to Michigan State was a disgrace because Michigan State was terrible last year. Especially but, right then. I mean, oh, that's yeah. the thing to remember is they were a total mess that first week. Expected because how do you prepare for a season without knowing anybody, you know, face-to-face on your team? Yep. And then week two for that to happen is the most alarming part of it. Well, and I mean, they had the Northwestern win, but other than that, it was really the whole right. abbreviated season. Like, that was the thing. They either win as a huge underdog outright or they get bombed by whomever else right. they play. Right. It, it was a bad team, and I don't. Yes. No, I don't think anyone in Spartan Nation is mad that it was right. a bad team. Like if you had told us up front, like, yeah, you're gonna win the Michigan game and beat Northwestern, who's like one of the two best teams in the conference. Like, oh, they played man. hard. Well, know? after Rutgers, right. yeah. we thought we were gonna go winless. So it's <laughs> yeah. like if you told me after the Rutgers game that yeah. I was gonna have the Paul Bunyan trophy in my <laughs> yeah, studio, you go. You I, I got Paul Bunyan with two <laughs> with two bulbs on him. I, yeah. I, I said he was sitting in there in the dark. I told my set designer, Eric, I said, we got to get some lights in the ceiling. Paul's in the dark. That's true. Paul's up there. Up now, yeah. Mel Tucker put Paul on my wall. I, I don't know how that happened. Week two. I don't know how it happened either. That's a good. I think we forget about that game a lot, right? Because so much happened it's last stunning. Year. It's yeah. stunning that that happened. And there was nothing like, oh, Michigan outgained them three to one, but there were six fluky fumbles in the rain. Like they, no, they just kicked their ass. They just like lost. There was nothing. Yet, right? And everyone says, oh, three point loss. It was really like a ten point loss. It was yes, the, the old I would way agree that too. Yeah, it was a ten point game. They gave up a bullshit touchdown at the end right. in garbage time. But they really, like, Michigan State comfortably won in Ann Arbor yep. with the twenty seven fans there. So, I mean, you know, it's just bizarre. I don't know. I, I think the MSU loss was the turning point. I can only speak for the people in my mm-hmm. sphere, but that's when they had enough. I mean, it, the ones yes. I know, no, like yeah, that, I, that was it. The that damn was broke. The, there was no one left, I would say, that that I was hearing from that was like, I still think this. You know, like there yeah. was. that's the day where you're the damn broke in that sense. Yeah, yeah if, you, if, you guys, if you guys like Michigan and want to feel like, you know, empathized with, yeah. or if you hate Michigan and you want some Schadenfreude, go to the Maize and Brew podcast from after mm. the Michigan State loss last year. It's still up there. Our friend Anthony Broom with Chris Castellani. Like, I just, even though I don't like Michigan, I am so related to that. It just <laughs> felt like so many losses I've endured. Right. So, I mean, that's, if you have any doubt about where they stood, that was not like a, I'm, I'm mad about a loss like any fan's mad about a loss. Right. That was a, like, we have to it think It was different, of, yeah. They were rethinking their whole life. That's it for Jim Harbaugh. <laughs> I, you know, okay, I got to get you the fuck out of here, but let's get speed round going. Okay. Let's rip through it. Poor Nick. I, N- Nick said, yeah, I can give you about an hour. We're, we're cooking. Where we at? Oh, we're good. We're all right. So as long as you're okay. Yeah. We'll, so, okay. Speed well, it's your round, so you can go as fast as you want. Okay. So we'll start here. You've covered a lot of them. Nicest athlete you've covered. Don't care about how good they are as a player. Nicest, Nicest guy. athlete I have covered. Um... Jack Miller, center of Michigan. Love oh, Jack. Good. All right. Wonderful. Most difficult athlete you've covered. <laughs> There's Delman Young in, in the silver bracelet. Most difficult. Um, I would say 
Taylor Luan and Devin Funches were were could be difficult guys just because and not because they were they were kids, right? And I think that I would say that a lot with um college athletes. I I'm going over the lightning round here, but like the, they were very talented players who were on bad teams and often I think felt like they had to defend themselves a lot and sometimes I think that rubbed them the wrong way and they could be challenging yeah. maybe yeah. you. Well, Taylor Lawan was also very busy uh, bullying rape victims. Allegedly. Not great sometimes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's a, he was difficult in a whole other way, but yeah, he's kind of a scumbag. Anyway, moving on. Mel Tucker's new MSU program. He was named, he made a cameo appearance in tonight's show. We've talked about Mel a lot on the Spiro Avenue show. What do you just make of his new program? What, like, what, where do you think it's going? Do you like what he's trying to do there? Just in a few sentences. Uh, TBD. I do. I like a lot of what they did. Uh, right away, but it's like last year they were so screwed by this pain. I mean, they they just now finally are able to go out and recruit. I keep telling, I tell Colton all the time, um, and Colton Pound said, Colton's been on with you, hasn't he? Colton's yes, been here? yes, great guy. Um, you can't recruit Detroit via Zoom, right? You got to do it in person. So, melt uh, encouraged, but TBD. I still I need to see more on him. Okay, you like you like the sort of some of the signs. Okay, yeah, fair enough. All right, we completely neglected this one. How about this? Just in the interest of time, but Panay Sewell, I think. Very high approval rating amongst the fan base. Yep. Even I thought it was the right way to go. What do you make of Panay Sewell? What are you seeing? How do you feel about him? Oh, he's a freak. Uh, he was the best, I mean, he was the best tackle in the draft. Um, he and Rashawn Slater were the two guys I think they chose between. And Sewell athletically is not. I've never seen anything like him in terms of a guy who can run out in space. A great pick in theory, but you know, twenty years old, and it's like we'll see. I do like the situation they put him in though. With Fraley, he knows Hank Fraley. You've got Rag now. You've got Decker. Um, it could be a very good offensive line. Yeah, a little less pressure going to right yeah. tackle. Yes. New, new position to learn, but you're not in the higher right. profile spot of the Great two. Spot. Especially when your quarterback struggles under pressure. Though, so, uh, speaking of quarterbacks, uh, <laughs> they had some association with the Lions. There he is. Matthew Stafford's 2021 season, both in terms of individual performance and what you think the Rams will do with him. How do you feel about Matthew Stafford going into his year one with the Rams, who paid Aikens ransom to get him? I think it's going to be really good. <laughs> I think it's going to be really good. I, I'm not like totally, totally sold. I guess um, because I do think there were issues on that team last year that maybe extend beyond golf, but not a lot. I think most of them were quarterback related. And I think when you listen to McVay's sort of, you know, you read between the lines on what he wants to do with them. I mean, if Stafford and he kind of click mentally, that's going to be the big, because McVay is so controlling. If he allows him the freedom, I think it could be great. If, though, he wants to over-control it, maybe that draft pick coming back ends up being a little bit better for Detroit. I'm not yeah. totally convinced it's going to be, like, lock awesome, but it very well could be. I, I think he's going to be fantastic. I think it probably will It's going to be like Peyton Manning yeah. in Denver. Like, maybe not 55 touchdowns, but, like, high, yeah, high I think it'll level. Be good. Yep, I agree. All right, last but not least. You were on the college beat for a long time. Here's a picture of Franklin Street, my other school, UNC, Chapel mm -hmm. Hill. Best college town you have visited. You're spending 24 hours. Any college town you've been in, where are you taking Best that 24 hours? Oh, man. I can't use, like, Manhattan or Chicago and cheat and say Rutgers and, like, North. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's, that's, that's cheating. Best college town. Yeah, um, that's cheating. Uh, do, 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 do. I'm trying to think here. Madison, Wisconsin is very good. I'm trying, I love Ann Arbor. Which is where I live. And I'm biased on that one, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say Ann Arbor. Madison, Wisconsin is very good. Um and I would say I'm trying to think of some places down south, like Vanderbilt, Tennessee, a lot of those places down south. I can't pick one down south. Anywhere in the southeast, Alabama. You ever been there for a football Saturday? I have not. Bucket you list, try that. by the way. LSU Alabama, Alabama is what I want. Or to LSU go. would be yeah. another two. LSU is pretty cool too, because I did see Mike the Tiger. Those are the two that always stand out to me. I've been to Alabama and LSU for games, and LSU and Alabama are very unique in just their own personality, so I'd go there. Uh, my buddies always went to Madison, like, when we were yeah, there. Yeah, Madison's so, a really good Big Ten town. But I was, I'm old enough that the Big Ten had not expanded again when I was there, but Madison was the only Big Ten school I hadn't been to. Now it's actually Maryland and uh, Madison. And it's funny, because it's, like, clearly, I think, the yeah. best one by all counts. Yeah. So Baton Rouge at night there. is awesome, although I would also say that uh, Virginia Tech, that Lane Stadium, Blacksburg, Mike, Blacksburg, the big wall of yeah. sound. Ooh, shit. that's loud. That's legit. Uh, to check that that's out legit. too. Yeah, man. If I were like a single dude, that, yes, yeah. I, like I, I would just go. Fifteen I, years ago, yeah, I go six games a year. But right. you know, that's not really realistic. Right. So Nick Baumgartner, man, it was great to have yeah. you. 
Uh, you, your kids canceled their volleyball game tonight <laughs> for the first time. In four, they had four years consecutive. Yeah. Uh, they've had 1,400 <laughs> volleyball games at all. I've totally exaggerated. Yeah. You, you only turned me down once or twice. But, uh, <laughs> it was great to finally have you. Uh, honestly, a big admirer of your work and have been for a it, long yeah. time. And I thought you were the best in that Michigan lane when you were there. You've graduated to you know a, a different company and sort of yeah, a more bigger fun, role yeah. and senior role there. So I just you know keep up the great work, man. I, it's it, man. great to have you. Absolutely. and love what you do. That's Nick Baumgartner from The Athletic. Um, yeah, he's been on pretty much every top 10 journalist in the state, sports journalist list in the state that I've made. So, there you uh, go. yeah, Nick is wonderful. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, thanks for, you know, being so boisterous. When I had Matt McQuaid in here, God bless him, but Too quiet. he let me do all the talking. I felt I've, He's on staff now. He's going to have to I figure know. it out. Yeah. I know. Well, he's, a, he's a great guy. Yeah. But I, I just say, yeah, I mean, come on, he probably he didn't want to talk to me that much. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm shocked he actually agreed to do it, but it's always good to have right. a, big, a big mouth like me, man. So you and Andy Isaac were the biggest talkers we had. There you go. It was great to have a Nick Baumgartner from The Athletic. Check him out. Uh, we have a, a promotion that we owe you guys still for Crane's Detroit visits that we were doing in honor of Chad Livengood being here the other night. We are going to do the same thing for The Athletic, nice. so stay tuned. We are going to be dark for about 10 days. I'm going out of town. It's very exciting. <laughs> uh, going to Saugatuck, nothing too sexy, but uh, family trip. Looking forward to that. Going to see uh, Good time you know, the, for it. Yeah, the nieces and nephews and go. beautiful time of year. So uh, we're not going to see you for about a week and a half. So you're welcome for the three shows in five days, people. But uh, <laughs> you got to give me a break. But we have a lot of fun stuff coming up, a lot of big stuff coming up. And if you can get Nick Baumgartner to finally say yes, I mean, it's a you and Brendan Quinn. We'll I'll, get Brendan. Yeah, I'll have to bother him. Yeah, Brendan Quinn is playing hard to get, man. He, <laughs> he, he is the prettiest girl in school. Yeah. So, And I was not the most handsome. But, uh, <laughs> it was great to have you. Ben, we always say the great and powerful Oz on the other side of the wall, who never has more than about four hours notice to put together the sheet prep uh, that, I, that I give him and does a wonderful job job eric williamson who is probably by now again in his boxers on his couch at home <laughs> watching thank you eric dylan smith who does all the work for us on social media so i don't have to because i'm bad at it i have an instagram with four posts on my personal thank you to dylan thank you to you guys we are going uh, going to the moon here you guys are wonderful I, I've, I've received such nice feedback from you people and i don't know why you're watching i don't think <laughs> but it's keep for, doing it right? uh, but but keep doing it so thank you again nick Baumgartner. this Absolutely. was justin spiro you were great Hopefully people thought I was tolerable. I'm working on myself. You know, I'm like Jeff Okuda. I'm like Jim Harbaugh. I'm reading Dr. <laughs> Phil books. I'm working on me in year 34 of my life. <laughs> Justin Spear, we'll see you next time.